So the interest in heritage was never planned. Swerving that way, I think, uh, going into heritage. As a woman working in the field of heritage, do you think more representation now in the Arab region for women working in, the, in this field? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of our podcast, My Heritage. Today's guest had an interesting journey in the field of heritage, from starting to work in Korea, to shifting all the way internationally to work in Italy. Welcome Eugene Jo. Thank you Najma, very nice to be here. Eugene, tell us, how did you start working and shaping your field in heritage? I started immediately after I graduated from university. It was actually by chance that I started to work in World Heritage. There was an announcement, a job announcement, uh, looking for somebody who could work uh, in the UNESCO-related World Heritage Convention in the government agency um, in Korea called the Cultural Heritage Administration. I applied and got the job, truthfully, I did not know about the World Heritage Convention before I actually got the job. I studied for um, the application uh, and uh, that sort of opened up my path into working in the World Heritage uh, sector. So the interest in heritage was never planned before? It was there. I actually majored in history. So uh, ever since I was in primary school, I did think that I would go into studying history or something of the related uh, areas. So, and uh, during my university years, I did volunteer and work in the university museum, um, helping out in curating different exhibitions and uh, compiling different publications. So I was sort of swerving that way, I think, uh, going into heritage, but uh, it wasn't actually a planned uh, journey, to be, to be honest. So, Definitely there are some remarkable events or people that come to your mind whenever we're talking, talking about since you started and all the way until today. Tell us about it. People. Hmm. Um, I think uh, the initial, my initial encounter with heritage as a whole and not necessarily world heritage, was it started when I was working as a student in the university museum. Um, the university excavation team had actually happened to excavate a mummified body uh, from the 16th century. And uh, it was a sort of a phenomenal find uh, that they were preparing an exhibition for. And uh, this mummy was actually the start of my uh, work in heritage because I was there to compile all the findings together, well, help and assisting in compiling all the findings and the, and the documents together to make sure that we could have a publication coming in. And uh, that sort of opened my eyes into how many different areas of expertise is needed in order to study heritage. They, we needed medical doctors, we needed nutritionists to track what the mummy had eaten before she died. Um, there were uh, cloth, uh, experts in clothing, you know, from the traditional clothes and fabric, textile. There were people who were reading the letters that were excavated together, soil experts trying to understand what, uh, you know, the composition of all the surrounding of the tomb itself. So it just opened my eyes as to how complicated and complex the area of heritage was. And I actually have to thank the, the mummy <laughs> that was excavated that actually really did change my career path. Seeing the mummy being excavated, it did not make you interested in part participating in excavation? I, well, I wasn't there at the point of excavation. I was there only at the exhibition stage. So already after they had gone through all the scientific research and study. Um, but actually studying about all the different backgrounds and the, and the research that was conducted surrounding that excavation uh, was very, very interesting. So working in Korea, how did it shape 
your career in the heritage field? So after I started working at the museum, I did think that I would like to pursue a career in heritage rather than in history, uh, which was more, at least uh, from my university training, it was more on documents and uh, sort of desk-based research into old, old archives and records. Um, the aspect that I could actually touch and feel and, and have a much more tangible relation to the past through heritage was very appealing. So I started to look for positions or jobs that I could utilize um, that opportunity. Uh, as a child, I had actually grown up in multiple different countries and uh, I did have English as almost as a na native language. So I was trying to look out for jobs where I could combine both heritage and English together in Korea. And uh, I don't know if it was by pure luck and chance that uh, it was at that moment that this job posting, looking for somebody who could work with heritage but with um, enough English communication skills to be able to write and read and, and process documents uh, was announced and uh, I applied and got the job. <laughs> uh, I believe that there was a major shift in the field of heritage since you started until today. How was that? I think within World Heritage, I'm very privileged to work in the sector because I do think that um, what we do in the World Heritage Convention does have a very large impact in all over the world uh, in what heritage professionals do. So I'm very, I'm always honored and slightly overwhelmed, I guess, that I'm, I'm working in, a, in, a, in an area where it does have a lot of impact um, worldwide. I think the major change um, ever since I started and up till now between those sort of 20 years that I've worked in is definitely the shift of talking about heritage as a sort of an expert professional uh, area to talking about heritage for society, heritage for everybody and genuinely making sure that heritage is cherished and enjoyed by everybody. There were definitely challenges that you have faced during this journey. Could you tell us about some of the challenges you faced? Mm. So working in World Heritage, it was, I think, my first encounter with working with World Heritage was to prepare nomination dossiers. And one of the biggest challenges then was that when I was used to talking about heritage, I was confined to talking about heritage from a Korean perspective. And working on World Heritage made me think about how can I present, how can we present this site to be appealing and actually understandable by the global audience, which was not something that I had trained for necessarily. And uh, it did actually take a lot of effort and I think trial and error to understand what it was within my culture and my history that would actually be special enough, um, understanding what were the special points and how to explain it, the process was one of the biggest challenges that I did face when first working on World Heritage. Communicating people about World Heritage and telling them about it when they don't have a background in it, was it easy? No, it was not easy, <laughs> especially when I started because World Heritage was not as popular as it was as it is now. So back then it was, uh, it was very still a, a, a slightly vague concept, I think. And it was a very far away um, idea to be talking about UNESCO and heritage and world heritage to, uh, on top of all of that. But I think times have changed quite a lot and now everybody knows what world heritage is and they may not know the details of how it works, 
but at least the concept of world heritage and the fact that it's a UNESCO-driven program and um, that it's the source of many different activities, I think that part is very well communicated. But at the beginning, it wasn't easy explaining what I was doing. <laughs> As we were saying in the beginning, you have worked and you've started working in the field of heritage in Korea. And then you decided to move all the way to Italy and work internationally there. Tell us about it. Was it easy to adapt to? So the change, I think, sort of started when I was, when I started, when I took the capacity building course that eChrome was providing for um, during the time that I was working in Korea. So I had been working in the field already 10 years um, within Korea, but still had that international perspective because I was working with World Heritage, with Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention, with Memory of the World. So there were many different aspects that kept me open to the international um, areas of work. But uh, in 2015, I actually enrolled in one of the capacity building courses that eCrom was providing, and it really did change the way that I looked. And I wanted to go forward in learning and, and, and actually practicing heritage. Um, after that, I actually sort of resigned from my government post and started to think that I would like to study a little bit more. So I started to pursue my doctoral degree. But in the moment that I was starting to do my doctoral degree, and, and while I was finishing off my doctoral degree, um, the position in ECRAM opened, uh, this position that I'm holding right now. So, and I thought, I have nothing to lose to <laughs> maybe apply and be there. And I got the job and, and moved to Italy. It was not easy to, be, to begin with, uh, especially the language aspect and the fact that the work that I was doing is no longer contained or sort of focused in one country, but I actually had to have that global coverage. So it wasn't, def it wasn't easy, but it was, it was very exciting and, and I still enjoy it every day. Amazing. Um, Eugene, the Arab region have went through numerous challenges over the last 15 years. How did you, how did you view these changes, especially that it was the first time in history that cultural heritage is being internationally targeted? These Issues, I think, are very difficult, but I don't think they're necessarily contained just to the Arab region. Um, I think it's a global issue where people are understanding that heritage is actually a very symbolic node, and they know the power of what can be impacted if either they conserve or harm heritage as a whole, and that sort of puts heritage in a very vulnerable position, perhaps, especially in conflict situations. Um, having said that, I have to say that the Arab region has been one of the most exciting areas, the regions that I did work with. The fact that you actually share a common culture, a common language, and a sort of a common understanding, a background, to be able to work in heritage is really, really fantastic. And uh, it's a very exciting region to be working in because there are so many different challenges, but there is sort of that, that common stream that uh, flows underneath all of, all of the different uh, countries in the Arab region. From your point of view, how did the Arab region adapt to the changes that happened to the heritage field? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> I think for the sake of heritage, um, I'm not so sure if, if we can say that the Arab region adapted to these challenges because I think the challenges are always there, and it's actually, as I said, not only limited to the Arab region. Um, but I think as a whole, the 
entire region is is one of those regions that actually do have a very high appreciation for history, for tradition, and for actually upholding the role that heritage can play in modern and contemporary society. So I think it's, a, it's an ever-evolving situation where it's hard to say that suddenly it was a different situation and the Arab region suddenly adapted. I think it's, a, I think it's an ongoing process and uh, where the, the culture of, of conserving and protecting heritage has always been there. Um, and it's just, uh, just taking on different forms. Eugene, you have conducted multiple capacity building programs, but when was the start? The start was when I received capacity building as a participant, um, and that's when I actually got to know about the power because I experienced sort of the eye-opening chance to see things in a different way and not having to solve immediately my problems at the working environment, but having the time to think about the different aspects, to be able to talk to people, to ask what they think, having that luxury of, of thinking process for any kind of problems that I was facing was really, really important for me. So I think my starting point of capacity building was when I was a part a participant in a part of a course. Um, but the genuine working experience started when I joined ECROM um, in 2017. And uh, I started to coordinate the program called the World Heritage Leadership Program, which was a new sort of initiative. It was a new initiative between IUCN and ECROM. So it was trying to build a new program of activities that would interlink culture and nature together and also talking more about the importance and the role of people. And these were all very, very new ideas at that time where we all agreed that these were good directions to go, but we didn't quite know what to do about it. So um, yes, the exciting experiences started in 2017. How did the capacity building benefit the heritage? I think it benefited heritage because uh, the activities that we do sort of gave a comforting sense to the people out there that they're not the only ones facing challenges. That uh, everywhere we go in different heritage sites, there are multitude of issues and problems. And sometimes, you know, you have bigger issues than others. Sometimes your issues are more deep-rooted and uh, a little bit more challenging. But at the same time, the possibility of having that capacity building makes you think that you're not alone, first of all. You're not the only ones facing this issue. And that there can be various different ways to resolve those issues um, once you take a step back and have the time to think about different ways of moving forward. So in a way, I think it's bringing comfort. I'd, I'd like to think that it's bringing comfort to <laughs> many people around. And how was it uh, implementing the World Heritage Leadership Program in the Arab region? It's been a really great journey. I, I confess, before working at Ikram, I had never been to an Arab region country before. Uh, and I had not been able to visit any heritage sites in the Arab region. Now I can actually recite the many different countries that I've been to in the region, learned from how heritage is being conserved and protected in, in different, re different sub-regions in the Arab region as well. And uh, being able to share the different experiences um, that the Arab region is going through. So, it's been, it's been really great. Also, primarily because the Arab region is very well coordinated. <laughs> so there, there are many different anchor points that we can collaborate with, especially with the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage. And uh, it's very easy to work with also because of the common language. Even though I don't speak Arabic, it's one of the facilitating 
factors, I think, that the whole region can come together with one language, even though there may be dialects or different, you know, uh, words that to describe yourselves. It's, it's envious to watch how the region can come together so closely. So you have visited most of the Arab countries. I wouldn't say most, but many. <laughs> Did you think there was a difference in the heritage sites, although they are, they are in the same region? Yes. I mean, even if they are in the same Arab region, as we sort of categorize them uh, within the UNESCO system, I mean, sites in North, Northern Africa compared to the sites in the Gulf region um, or in it, it's, it's, it's a very different situation, I think. Um, they all have different historical contexts and the way that they were built and, and, and used, I guess, uh, in their different functions, it's very interesting to see the differences, but also the commonalities. A couple of years ago, you have published an article under the title Resilience and transformation of heritage sites to accommodate for loss and learning in a changing climate. Uh, what are some of the challenges you have faced in terms of protecting heritage sites from the risks that are imposed on them? I think um, one of the biggest challenges that I personally find is sort of combating the concept that heritage cannot change. And that's probably why um, that article, uh, it, it, the, the background of that article was based on that sort of understanding as well. Heritage is something that also does change. We may make the change go slower <laughs> and uh, we may be able to control some of the changes and want to manage the changes as much as possible. But at the same time, if we don't allow it to change, it will also deteriorate, I think. So I think allowing that space for heritage to be able to also adapt and change is very important. And especially in the face of many disasters or many different risks that are out of our control. And uh, the whole paper was written in the understanding that sometimes the change that we cannot prevent or, or mitigate, sometimes it just makes the change so big on the heritage that rather than going back to what it was before, we might have to adopt the thought that we just go adopt, adapt to the change and move forward from there on. So it's talking about how much change are we able to, con, uh, let's say, accept or, or sort of fight back against. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do you think there is more awareness in the Arab region now towards adapting to climate change and trying to control the effects? Yes, because um, the Arab region is facing a lot of climate change impacts and they are not the same sort of phenomenon that are happening elsewhere as well. It's, it's also, I mean, climate change is affecting different places in the world with different results, different sort of uh, demonstrable um, phenomenon that happen on the ground. And it's very difficult to predict. And I think the awareness that the heritage sites also need to be prepared for climate change uh, impacts and that we need to be uh, adopting different measures of protecting and conserving and managing our sites is actually very, very prevalent in, in their Arab region. And uh, I, I do believe that uh, the sort of awareness level and the, the, the whole attitude towards working with climate change impacts has, has changed a lot in the Arab region. As a woman working in the field of heritage, do you think there is uh, more representation now in the Arab region for women working in, the, in this field? And 
has it been a bit balanced now? I've seen many powerful women <laughs> from the Arab region uh, working in the field of heritage. And I do wish to believe that I'm also aiding in that process as well, because when we implement different capacity building activities or implement all different types of, of programs, our first and foremost concern is, do we have women? Do we have gender balance? Do we have younger generations? Um, those people who, start, who are starting their careers, are they actually there in the room together with us? So that's been one of our primary concerns and making sure that we could address that issue. Having said that, it's never been in our position to say, oh no, we have too many men, so we should go out for more women because Surprisingly, when we do get applications, we do get really strong women. It's just we're, we make sure that they can also be selected. Okay. Um, Eugene Bahrain had great efforts in the field of heritage as it won the presidency of the World Heritage Committee for two years, in 2011 and in 2018. How, what do you think about the role of Bahrain in the field of heritage? I think the role of Bahrain has been fundamental in shaping the heritage agenda, especially within the World Heritage Convention. Um, I, I started working in the convention from 2005 onwards, and when Bahrain assumed the committee presidency in tw 2011, although at that time the hosting didn't happen in Bahrain itself, uh, it was actually very, very eye-opening to see leadership happening in a different way and form, because I have to admit that when I was being trained, uh, as I went through my education, my primary concern was either in Asia or the history of conservation that was actually sort of transferred and transmitted from the European perspective. So actually seeing a completely different region taking a leadership role in the whole sector of heritage was very, very refreshing and uh, eye-opening. And then in 2018, when Bahrain was actually hosting the committee again, this was the occasion that I was fully on board with ECROM and actually implementing the site managers forum here in Bahrain. And it was my first sort of very, very global activity that I had to implement. And working in Bahrain has been a really wonderful experience. And uh, hosting the regional center for world heritage uh, and, and continuously playing that really important role of networking and keeping in contact with all the different individual heritage people um, all over the region has been a really fundamental role, I think. Eugene, this was amazing. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. And thank you everyone who is listening to us for joining us in this remarkable uh, experience that has shaped Eugene in the field of heritage. We see you again, inshallah, in another episode of our podcast, My Heritage. My Heritage Podcast from the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage.